Um, I, I invited uh, Emma to the stage because Emma and Julie are working on a second book on uh, Julie's biography. So I'm going to let Emma do most of this, but I'm going to start with a just just a question to to open it up. Um, Julie, I read in several places that you have said that this is one of the very favorite film of yours. Arthur Hiller also said it was one of his favorite film of his, and James Garner as well. Yes, we all loved it. So loved why, it. Yeah, why, why, why is this so dear to you? Why in, in, in with all the work you have done? I think, uh, first of all, the irreverence and the great screenplay by Petr Chayefsky. It's so funny and so witty, and yet so truthful. Uh, it, it's as it's as uh, appropriate today really about the folly of war as it was then and it was one of the first films really about uh, one of the first I don't know if it was the first but it was just something that we all loved we all loved each other the cast was superb and just everything about it made it a very lovely happy experience what was the uh, I mean rewatching it yesterday and 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 today you s you you said the word irreverence I mean there are some lines in there you know God save us from the morally right, right. that is incredible yeah. especially you know to hear that yeah. today yeah. what what were the reactions to the film when when it opened <coughs> well it's become a sort of cult uh, film these days everybody loves it and and remembers it it seems those who who saw it and. Uh, I think it was very well received, even in those days, simply because it was well done. It wasn't preachy, it did it with comedy. Uh, my husband, Blake Edwards, always said, if you want to get something important across, do it with comedy. I think it was a little bit eclipsed, though, given when it came out in the trajectory of your career and in, in terms of what else was going on in filmmaking at the time, don't you? You mean in terms of me or in filmmaking in general? Well, both. I think I, I sort of feel as though the film itself got a bit of short shrift in, in terms of when it was released. It got wonderful reviews, but not necessarily the audience at the time that I think equals the fan base it has now. Yes, uh, it's definitely grown over the years and become a sort of cult movie, but um, I really don't know if it was eclipsed. I know for me, I'd made three films. I'd made Mary Poppins and then this and then The Sound of Music, and not one of them had been released. And I was having this wonderful time just playing at making movies and uh, enjoying myself immensely and loving meeting people and learning about my craft. And uh, then suddenly all three of them sort of almost came out in a row. I think you mentioned that uh, it ca uh, Emily came out first, but I think honestly... Uh, Mary Poppins, Poppins yeah, yeah, okay. Well, Emily was made second, and, and Mary Poppins was released first, then Emily, then Sound of Music, yeah. Y Julia mentioned that um, she invited me here because we're working on Mom's second memoir together, which we're about halfway through. Couldn't do it without moment. her, actually. Um, but, uh, but given that this was the second film in Mom's career, and this particular memoir deals with, begins with Mary Poppins and deals with her years in Hollywood, um, you know, Emily was one of the early chapters that we worked on, and of course we're still working on. Um, but but and there will are be for the next God knows how long, <laughs> right? <laughs> but there are some wonderful stories that I know um, from from working on that chapter with you, and I wondered if you would share some of them um, here. First of all, one of the things that I think is really interesting is how you were offered the part to begin with, and how generous Disney was in terms of the timing. Will yeah. you tell that story? Yes. Um, uh, Marty Ranselhoff, the producer of the film, uh, hadn't had really no idea how I was on, on film, and he asked Walt Disney if he could just see a little advance footage on Mary Poppins. And it was, yeah, really, now can you, <laughs> you know, I want her to be in my movie, and I'd like to see something of Mary Poppins to see if she's appropriate. Anyway, uh, Disney never did that, and, but in my case, he, he, he did. I don't know why he was so generous. I'm hugely grateful. Because it did offer me the opportunity to show that I wasn't just going to do like, uh, uh, unfortunately, well, or fortunately, actually fortunately, Poppins and Sound of Music were so huge that it, uh, um, Emily and uh, my part of Emily got a little buried and it was in black and white. But nevertheless, it was very generous of Disney to let 
Marty Ransahoff see me, and from that, I don't know what he saw of Poppins, but he guessed or thought I might be right for Emily. <laughs> And another wonderful story is, of course, working with Garner, with whom you've worked several times uh, since. Three so films, I think, I made with Garner, uh, Victor Victoria, and a lovely m movie that we did for television called One Special Night. And uh, always, I mean, he, uh, he was adorable, as you could tell. And uh, uh, he became a great friend, and uh, we just loved working together. It was one of those easy relationships and, and, and delicious too, I might add. Well, just why don't you just give them a little taste of that because that is such a great story, the, uh, <laughs> the love first scene one. story. The love scene. Mom's the first love scene ever. Uh, yeah, my first love scene <laughs> ever on, on film. And, uh, and you know my squeaky clean image in, in Mary Poppins. So I thought, I don't even know how to do a, a love scene. I've never done a love scene on film. And in fact, really hadn't on stage to, to speak of. And I thought, well, does one kiss properly? Does one just peck? What does one do? Well, uh, we did our first love scene. Almost the first thing we shot was that great scene on the bed when, when I first arrive in, in Charlie's bedroom. And I tell you, it took all afternoon to shoot it. And I thought, well, I'll just go with whatever anybody tells me to do. And um, and so we were rolling around, and one minute he was on top of me, and then I was on top of him, and then they did a different angle, and then they, and we're still on the bed, and we don't get up for the whole afternoon. And finally, I'm beginning to think, Whoa, it's a bit hot in here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was quite lovely, I have to say. And uh, finally, when our director, Arthur Hiller, who was an equally adorable guy, said, okay, that's, that's it, I think we have it. I got up off the bed and my legs buckled beneath me <laughs> <laughs> because it had been rather overwhelming. And I really mean this, I couldn't stand up for a minute. And uh, that's because I think uh, Mr. Garner kind of got to me in a way. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the sexual politics of the film are quite... Are quite Special the sexual politics of the oh. film are quite progressive. I mean, she shows up in his room. That's you know, right, and yeah. she she does, and he and then there's a lot of love scenes after that too, you know. Yeah. But but it, it and it, he was very good. I mean, he believe it or not, in this age when everybody's on you know with the Me Too movement and and appropriately so, he never did ever try to uh, take advantage. He just became a great great friend. And uh, I'll always be grateful for that. And um, in terms of the timing of the film, I don't know if everybody realizes, uh, Julia mentioned that it was released in 1964, but it was shot in uh, the latter part of 63 and the early part of 64. And do you want to just talk a little bit about that transition from shooting in London to LA and then the timing of November, the events in November? Oh my God, yes. Because in um, 1963, in November, uh, President Kennedy was shot. And we were to shoot the whole film in London, and then Marty decided that he was gonna pull the whole film and take it back to California, because a lot of it was interior, except for the footage on the beach at, Oma at supposed Omaha. And uh, so all of a sudden, there I was thinking I was gonna be home for a while, and within about two weeks of being back, off we went to California again. And within about another two weeks of that, we got news on the set that President Kennedy had been shot. And it was just unbelievable. You know how everybody says, where were you on the day that? And I'll never forget it, ever. And uh, everybody was in a kind of, a pall hung over the entire studio whatever was shooting on the, on the lot, just everything shut down and we shut down for like four days. And I just was stuck in, in Hollywood, not knowing very much about it other than having been in, in uh, Poppins working almost every day. And so it felt, I, I suddenly felt cut off from everything and I watched a lot of television and saw Jack Ruby shoot Oswald and all of that and it was so, bizarre at that time, uh, very sad. You talked about, um, when we were working on the chapter, you talked about how returning after that event 
there was, I mean, maybe it was also just where you were in this shooting sequence, but there was kind of a unified bond in the company. I think it was partially uh, Paddy's script. We were now getting into the real meat of the, of the film. But also because of that dreadful assassination, we as a company, we, we'd all been there together and something, we just all pulled together. And I don't think there was a single person in that film that I feel <coughs> was wrongly cast. I mean, um, Admiral Jessup uh, was so well played by Melvin Douglas. Yeah, he, you know, he was the great, great um, glamorous guy in the old days with the made movies with Garbo and so many phenomenal stars. He was a great leading man. And to see him, we would all get behind the camera and just watch him doing his scenes where he's folding and cracking up just because it was such a thrill to have him in the studio. They were, uh, several of them had actually served in the, in the oh, army, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, Jimmy, James Garner had and, and uh, Jimmy Coburn <coughs> um, and of course uh, um, um, Me Melvin Douglas, Paddy Chayefsky himself. He didn't come onto the set much, but he was lovely and a joy to have around. I mean, he loved all the guys and the fellas, and they they joked together, and I would sort of listen in a little bit. Uh, it's incredible. It's incredibly sophisticated how the film walks the line uh, being uh, critical of war and, 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 and making the point of war being absurd and silly and self-serving for the powers and with ne without never offending, you know, yes. the people that serve. It's really, it's really sharp and there's no phony heroism. And, and no, I mean, but, but to have a coward being the first man on Omaha Beach is such a wonderful conceit in a way. And really, there, I don't feel there was anything false about it. I used to think that perhaps the ending should have been that he truly was the first dead man on Omaha Beach and that the movie would end on that dark note. And a lot of people felt that, but viewing it today, I suddenly saw that, that Paddy Chayefsky had written one more twist and suddenly he's back, but it was a coward that, that was the first man on Omaha Beach and what are they gonna do? And he he gives you that one extra little punch, which I hadn't truly thought about until this afternoon. Was there a conversation about uh, the, the film having a different ending among? Well, to be truthful, I don't know. You, uh, uh, we, you mentioned that William Wyler was going to direct yeah. it to start with, with William Holden as Charlie Madison. And when uh, William Wyler, uh, he wanted a lot of changes and Did you want Capucine also? As uh, yeah, well, Wyler did. I mean, um, Holden. Did. Holden wanted Capucine, with whom he was uh, very much in love at the time, and uh, and they w they didn't want. Uh, well, actually, I don't think what it was was more that that Marty Ranserhoff didn't want the changes that Wyler asked for, and so it's rare that you get a producer. Uh, you know, he gave up a huge star like Holden to back um, Paddy Chayefsky and go with his script. And, uh, and of course, that's when Jimmy was brought in. And also, my husband, Blake Edwards, was asked, at least he told me, that he was asked to do it. He didn't, uh, and he turned it down for some reason. But, but he, he very sweetly said, and I would never have cast you in it, darling. And I said, well, I know why, I do. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about the music? I think there's a, there's a nice yeah. story there about the song that was to be. And then yeah, she knows, remembers more than I do. Um, um, Johnny Mandel, wonderful uh, composer, uh, wrote two songs for the theme of Emily. One was the one you heard, obviously, and the other was a beautiful song that he wrote called The Shadow of Your Smile. You probably all know that. And I thought that was the perfect uh, song for Emily, complicated and, and difficult and uh, uh, just a little bit more unusual. And I, oh, I went to bat for it and said, that's the one, that's the one. But Marty Ranserhoff knew that he was going to be making a movie with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton called The Sandpiper. And he said, no, I'm gonna save that one for that movie. And I thought, well, you 
Grotter. <laughs> He's sacrificing that beautiful song for, for, for Liz Taylor and Richard when we could have had it. But now, of course, it's such a beautiful, sweet theme, Emily is, and, and it's very clear. And again, he made the right choice. Speak, speaking of song, uh, Julie, I was wondering, you were coming from Broadway and from Poppins and yes, then into I Sound of Music. Yes, I do many dramatic were you, things. Were you concerned, because this is, this is a tough piece to do, that the dialogue is so relentless and so, you know. It, so it, it is, and there's a, I mean, poor James Garner had tons to say, especially in the scene with my mother. I mean, that's a long long monologue that he has. But by you two, were you concerned? Were you worried when you yes, started Yes, terribly shooting? worried. I thought, how am I? I mean, it was such a delicious script. I couldn't say no. And I knew it might help in the long run it, uh, to, to prevent being branded as just a squeaky clean lady that did musicals. And so I, I jumped at it, but I was very nervous. I didn't know really what I was doing. And I fault myself quite a lot in this movie. But um, I'm so pleased I did it. But I still think I could have done a lot. I mean, I'm not being uh, silly about it. I think I could have done it now a lot better. She, she never had any acting lessons in those days. No, so and I didn't know who to ask. I didn't know, I didn't have enough sense to ask to find a coach or to help me. And in those days, I sort of felt no one's supposed to be talented enough to just go ahead and do it. Well, duh, you take all the help you can get, you know. Also, it was really Arthur Hiller's, one of his early films as well. Yes. He, he wasn't really Had he yet. done Love Story then, no, Arthur? Not no, yet. Arthur Hiller directed Love Story also, which was huge. I mean, he'd done a lot of television before this, but yeah. he, was not, he was not yet really known as a Yeah, and like yet that. he was meticulous. I mean, the way he cut footage of the real D-Day with the footage that he shot on a beach about D-Day. I mean, it's hard to really, I can see the difference now, but you'd have to look pretty carefully, I think. Yeah, so I think part, part of the choice of black and white was to intercut that. Well, that was his choice too. Yeah. That was Arthur Hiller's was choice. It, was it, a, was it an, a, a popular choice at the time? Because no, I, think, I so. think a lot of people said, why black and white? But he appropriately argued that you couldn't, I mean, Technicolor, for a war film and one set in that era, there weren't Technicolor movies in those days. And so he felt it would give it a lot more dramatic heft and, and be worth doing. And I think he made the right choice. I really do. It would have looked too pretty uh, in It would have romanticized color. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't that. It was a satire and black and bleak and truthful and funny. There are some scenes that are so indelible and so enjoyed by me. I mean, the drunk scene w where they're all sitting uh, and they're all drunk just before getting on the, on the boat to go to France, it just pleasures me so much. There there's the young man who never says a word except, well, I'm cutting out and slides under the table. He never says a word and he was brilliant. I'd never seen him before and Blake had seen him in that f film and said, he's good and hired him, I think, twice Hard. or three times. Steve Franken was his name, played the best role. Did, if any of you ever saw the party of Blake Edwards with, with Peter Sellers, Steve Franken is the waiter in that who gets so drunk and, and eventually keeps drinking everybody else's drinks. Same man. Yeah. There's a lot of lovely um, sort of connections for, to future films and prior films. And Keenan Wynn, for instance, in well, that scene. Did you know that Keenan Wynn was Ed Wynn's son, who played uh, um, Uncle Albert? Albert, thank you. <laughs> I am old. Um, Uncle Albert in Poppins, and this was his son uh, in, in this movie. And just many, many lovely connections like that. Oh, and Joyce Grenfell, the lady that played my mother. Well, when I was very young, I toured endlessly in vaudeville in England, and she was on the bill and a, and a headliner and played kind of wonderfully dotty, well, a little bit as she was in the movie, a kind of slightly horsey, good lady. But Jolly very hockey fun. sticks. Jolly like hockey sticks, yeah. as we yeah. say, yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. Do you want to, would you like to yeah. open it up to some questions? Yeah, just, I want to I just ask one, one more thing. Uh, I was wondering what you thought when you read the script about the play, 
you know, the play in between the, uh, the stereotype or the, uh, the, the essence of the British and the essence of the American. Yes. Um, I thought it was pretty accurate. I mean, he, they were coming on, at least in the movie, uh, Charlie Madison is coming on so strong with the wonderful nylon stockings and all the booze and all the chocolates and everything. And the Hershey bar being the sort of metaphor that, that everybody uh, adored having all the chocolates in those days. I was uh, raised during the war, and so I was well aware of, and I entertained at some of the American uh, camps w for the troops at a very young age. And stage so door canteens. Stage, yes, also that. And I was well aware of the kind of goodies that were being spewed everywhere by the Americans, and, and the poor British didn't have a thing. While you were sharing an egg with your brother. Yes, my brother and I would have an egg, one egg a day, and sometimes he'd have the white of the egg, and I'd have the yolk, and other days we'd swap the other way around. Why it couldn't have been scrambled, I don't know, but there you are. <laughs> my mother wasn't a great cook that way, and sometimes she was away too. <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you have a question. There is one here. Yes, sir. Isn't it? Well, I don't know, to be really honest with you. Certainly, once we started filming, I don't think there were many rewrites. I'm not sure about the ending. There may have been some work, but I think there may have been some discussion as to whether it should be sober or funny or whatever. But, but actually, the, the, the base of it, the bulk of it, that's what I read, and that's what appealed when I, when I said, oh, God, I'd love to do this. There's a good and he story. Did, obviously, he did network and, and you know, so many great... Didn't he alter... Uh, no. Um, Patty Chayefsky. <coughs> yes. Didn't he do the um, hospital? hospital? Yeah. Yeah, yeah hospital and network. There's a good story, actually, about the scene with Joyce Grenfell and Garner. And uh, we were talking about that Arthur, uh, Garner was having trouble with the monologue. Yeah. Uh, because it was so wordy and because it was so and dense. He, he, too, wasn't sure how to keep speaking and doing it. And, and what was it Arthur Hiller said to him in order to... He said, don't emphasize every word, Jimmy. Just say it as if it were natural conversation. And it helped J Jimmy a lot. And we reshot it, uh, actually, uh, a second day because he felt he could do it better. Jimmy did. And... Uh, it helped a lot, uh, Hiller's advice. In other words, with, with language that is so rich, let the, let the language do the heavy lifting for you. You don't have to put your own added spin on it, I guess, is the, yeah, the acting lesson. There. I wish so much that I'd lowered my voice. Uh, uh, I'm not so uh, up there most of the time, but anyway. <laughs> yes. On the stage in the first place? Oh, gosh. Well, I'd have to go back a long, long way. My mother married my stepfather, a man called Ted Andrews, and eventually I took his name because it was convenient. I didn't. They, they changed my name legally. And I was a Julia Wells when I was born. And then at about seven, they changed my name to Julia Andrews. And he was a tenor, a fine singer, Cut a very long story and short. And my mother was a concert pianist. And my mother was a concert pianist. <clears throat> but because of the war, because of being very, very poor, uh, she needed a job. Everybody needed a job in those days. And uh, we were all hugely poor. And so she would go off and play in concert party, met Ted Andrews, and they fell in love and eventually married. Well, because he was a tenor and a good one from Canada, uh, when I went to live with them in London, uh, I, God knows why, because he didn't know that I could sing, but he decided to give me some singing lessons and be discovered that I had a really freak singing voice, about four octaves long and very white, and I could do all these amazing calisthenics at that age. And it wasn't until I was about 16 years old that the voice began to warm a little and not be so freakily high. But I made a debut in London when I was 12 and uh, singing one song and... In their act. 
No, in uh, Starlight Roof. Oh, I said yeah. before that. Oh, before that, I would tour with my parents sometimes and stand on a beer crate beside my stepfather and sing just to reach the microphone and with my stepfather, and we'd sing a duet. And I kind of thought it was okay and didn't really like working with him. And he very quickly put me in touch with his singing teacher, who was the real thing. And she was a fine dramatic soprano. And she became my, my full-time teacher because the voice just kept growing and growing and improving. After the first debut, when I was about 12, the really big one, I then toured endlessly round and round and round England doing vaudeville, musical, English pantomimes, which aren't pantomime, they're um, uh, fairy tales that are musicalized and enjoyed every, every, se every Christmas season. And so uh, I'd been working the boards, so to speak, for a long, long time. All Initially my with, teens. with her parents, but eventually, Out in the beginning, own. it was Barbara and Ted Andrews with little Julie Andrews in small print underneath, and then eventually it became, uh, then Ted stopped touring, and it became Barbara and Julie Andrews, and eventually it became Julie Andrews with Barbara at the piano. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, and then even she, uh, about, I didn't have really much of an education at all. I couldn't go to school, because I was kind of, you know, we all needed money so badly in those days. So I had had experience in theater, but more to do with pleasing audiences and coping with audiences who were pretty rowdy in vaudeville in those days. I mean, they'd be drinking up in the balcony and throwing beer cans at each other and things like that. And I'd be belting out my, my coloratura arias. But so these, uh, these early films, uh, Poppins and Emily and, and Sound of and Music and, and those early directors were hugely influential in terms of They were, but education. also uh, the really big education that I got was from vaudeville. I made three huge, uh, they, were hu they were pillars in my career. The first was that big success when I broke through because of my singing voice at 12. And then at about 18, I went uh, to... America to star in a show called The Boyfriend, and that happened to be very successful. And then about 10 years later, eight years later, I went off to Hollywood and made a movie. So I had had the years on Broadway and the years in vaudeville to get used to performing, and it wasn't the singing that was a problem. It was mostly that I'd never really, I'd taken a few elocution lessons in my youth, but nothing to speak of. There you are, long story. Uh, well, apart from Jimmy Garner, you mean, right? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I just think for some reason it felt sort of right. It felt right here. I felt that I understood her, that, that um, um, it's just what I liked was the script, and we all actually felt the same. It's a little wordy these days, but it really is well written. And the twists it turn, it takes, twists and turns, and the black side of it. And I mean, when he's wading through the sea, uh, uh, trying to get away from Omaha Beach, and <laughs> that idiot, uh, James Coburn, is saying, take pictures, take pictures. And, and because he fires at him, it sends him back up onto the beach where he didn't want to be in the first place. I mean, wonderfully delicious, silly, very real stuff in a way. Is he? Good. Well, you have to remember that that Poppins was 60 years ago. My Fair Lady was 50 years ago. I think anybody could have a crack at it after that many years now, I think. and um, But the Poppins film that's about to come out is not actually a remake. Just no, just in fact, that's actually true. Yeah, yeah um, you had, I don't know how many of you were here for Chicago the other day, but you saw uh, Rob Marshall uh, who has just finished, or, or is editing at this moment, the new Mary Poppins that's being done. And it's nothing to do with the original. Uh, when Walt Disney bought 
Mary Poppins. He bought the rights to all the other Mary Poppins stories. So he had all those things in, the, in his trunk, so to speak, and decided, Disney decided that they could now make a second movie uh, with a different theme. I think they're using certain things like a couple of generations later, it's the same Banks family, I believe, but very different. So that's lovely and fine, but I don't know what would, I mean, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Were you involved in, 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 in working with, you know, did you talk to Marshall about Poppins? Um, and, and no, I didn't. And I thought that it would be better if I just gave it my blessing, which I did. And, I mean, Emily Blunt is playing Poppins, and I think she's terrific. And I love her, and I know I've met her. And all I did was just say, she'll be terrific, and I wish her well. Because, so, as I say, that many years later, what, what should I do? Nothing. That is the sort of wonderful thing, though. I mean, the amazing thing about your career. Um, I remember when we, we write, we also write children's books together in addition to working on her memoirs. And um, early on, at one of the first book signings we were going to, I remember being very struck by the fact that um, we were seeing th three generations come to these book signings. So we would see grandmothers and grandfathers and mothers and fathers and then children. And the grandmothers and grandfathers would come and say, you know, do you see, do you see, it's, it's Mary Poppins, it's, it's, it's uh, Maria von Trapp or whatever. And, and, they, and then the mothers would say, no, 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 it's, it's Victor Victoria. And the, and the children were sort of like, you know, and then finally, Princess Daria, yeah, right? Then finally, <laughs> one where someone would say it's Queen Clarice, and then the children would go, "Oh, you know," <laughs> or or the uh, Queen from Shrek, or yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah. So it's kind of a, it's kind of an amazing. Oh, I lucky. Yeah, yeah, kind of an amazing thing. Well, proud of and fond of it two different things. I think, God, have you gotten a glimpse of that, darling? I, I mean, duet for one, probably, yeah. um, maybe. There was a film that I did which opened on Christmas Day and was a terrible flop, but it was a difficult, difficult role, and I think it was the most unusual thing I've ever taken, uh, tackled, and that it was based on a on a, a real true story, true story yeah. about a, a woman, Jacqueline Dupre, the right. great cellist, and who, I played who a violinist. Had, uh, MS. Yeah, and so I was in a wheelchair for most of the film. And uh, anyway, it was a, that was a good movie, but but difficult to do. And uh, uh, duet for one is the movie. It was directed by Andrei Konjolovsky, who was a Russian, and um, uh, he did a. He, he pulled the performance out of me, really. But, but as for loving, um, I loved a lot of them. And each one you love for a different reason, obviously. They're like puppies in a basket. Which one can you say that you love the most? They're so different. But I loved um, uh, That's Life with Jack Lemmon and Blake. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I love doing it because we shot it at, in, in, in our house. It was very crazy, that one. Uh, you know, we'd go to bed at night and they'd still be taking the lights down from our bedroom. And we'd say, it's okay, fellas, we're just gonna get in. You just keep taking the lights down. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be cooking scrambled eggs for everybody at three in the morning one night. But. One of the most, um, just in the work that we've been doing on the bio, one of the most unbridled, sort of joyous experiences seems to have been Millie. Yeah, and just in terms of your recollection of it as one of the truly happy films to have made. That was a silly, sweet, happy movie. and Thoroughly modern Millie. Yeah, equally funny in a very camp way. But, but George Roy Hill was the director, and I had just finished working with him on Hawaii. He was a hugely talented man because he did everything from musicals to dramas to, to uh, Kurt Vonnegut uh, movies to... Um, Oh, gosh. Uh, he did the sting. He did sting. the sting. Yeah. He did indeed. And, and so many. And suddenly, Millie, this, this light, frothy movie, what was delicious about Millie, which I should share, is that you, if you ever get the chance to see the movie, notice the coloring. It's actually a color film. But 
he made everything in color, but the palette was black and white and gray, but though it, it was Technicolor, and then one color theme for each important scene so that everything in the exterior of the movie had a red theme. I'd have a red carnation or a, or a red band on my dress or something like that. Everything, so anything outdoors had a red theme. Um, the party, uh, the, uh, the, the Jewish wedding was lilac, I think, and the, the dance was lemon yellow and green. I mean, it was really, and took forever to figure out in terms of the shots. And I mean, what if you went out and in and out and in? But it worked. I think we have time for a couple more. Yes, here. I think just by an unconscious, you know, process, I pro I'm sure I did, I know I did, comedy, for instance, since I'd watched Blake doing it so much. But, but I don't know what to tell you. I love doing them. I've done, uh, I did The Boyfriend, uh, directed The Boyfriend and loved it, and then did, what, the 50th or 60th anniversary of My Fair Lady? 60th. 60th, 60th anniversary of My Fair Lady. Victory. And then a book that Emma and I uh, wrote together, we adapted as a musical, which we're still hoping. We'll, we did it uh, as a tryout in, at good speed in, in Connecticut. But truthfully, I would say if anyone was an influence, it would probably would have been Moss. Yes, right? I think so. Moss Hart directed My Fair Lady and Camelot on Broadway. And I think of all the mentors, and I've had a lot of them in my life, I think he probably was the greatest because that and my wonderful singing teacher, of course. But he was a very, very perceptive and kind man. And if anybody who's read his biography, Act One, gets a phenomenal history of Broadway the way it was at a certain time. And when I wrote my first memoir, he again saved my life because I thought, well, he gave us a piece of history Maybe I, in the first memoir, can give a piece of history about the days of Bordeville in England. And maybe that's something that not everybody knows about. So, he, I mean, he was so generous. And he himself had been so poor and so lost as a child. I think he just empathized uh, as to where I might be coming from and just kept working with me and giving me the chance. And and really shaped Eliza Doolittle for me, and then Camelot was that much easier. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Can you take that? Sure. Take it for a while. We'll take it together. Um, well, both. First of all, we're both passionate readers ourselves, and, and advocates and of, of reading to children, and and books were an enormously important part of both of our childhoods for mom not having had much opportunity for schooling. When she was touring, books were her saving grace, and, um, and she loved to write stories as well, and that her tutor- As a kid. Her tutor would often hold that out as a reward, because um, she did have a tutor when she was touring, and she would say, if you finish your math, you can write a story. Um, so she, she had always loved writing, and mom started writing uh, long children's books long before we started writing together. She actually wrote her first middle grade novel in the 70s, in the early 70s, while she was uh, making a film called Darling Lily. Darling. Yeah. Um, so she had written several children's books. I had always been a, a closet children's book writer. Um, and I'd, I was very, I loved writing ever since I was a child. And I had sort of tried in my early 20s to write children's books and put them out there. But then I got swept up in working in the theater. And when, um, after, yeah, after, well, after your operation and also when you were under contract for your first memoir, um, yeah, that publisher. Yeah, I had that up my sleeve yeah. for the longest time. I'd been asked to do that memoir years before. But that editor said, do you, have you ever thought about writing for younger children? Yes. Uh, we were just meeting, I was meeting all the staff, I think, at, at the uh, publishers, and uh, they asked if I had anything for very young kids. And at the time I was, it was about a year after I'd had the throat operation that kind of took away the real voice that I had for singing. 
And I thought, if I don't do something, I'll go crazy. And I, I went home and said, I, let me think about whether I have anything for very young kids. Uh, and I said to Emma, if you wanted to get something for your son, what would it be? If you went to the library, what would you choose? You take it. So our son, uh, who was about a year old at the time, was already completely fanatic about trucks. I mean, he was pre-verbal. He was pointing Either with the trucks or dinosaurs, isn't it, Em? Yeah, pretty much. But he would look at them going down the street, and he would point, and he would go, ooh. And then his first words were all about trucks. And I had gotten to the point where ev he would only wear shirts that had trucks on them and sleep in sheets that had trucks on them. And every night we were reading the same, you can name 100 trucks book, which I can still name 100 trucks 21 years later. Um, yeah. <laughs> And so I said to mom, you know, I, I know exactly what it would be. It would be a book about trucks or something to do with trucks, but something that had some sort of, you know, thematic value, some, a story, a plot, some good characters, you know. I'm having something such a hard time. Something that wasn't a uh, dumb uh, truck on the, on the, on the um, well, truck those side. Those crunch. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. right. And um, I'm having trouble finding it. And, and mom said, well, maybe we should write it together. So that was our first effort. So that we didn't know if we'd be compatible writing together. And it's, I have to say, hasn't it been a ball ever yeah, since? Well, yeah. I made her say it, of course. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's over 30 books together now, so it's over, uh, yeah. yeah. And everyone, I don't think we've had a bad word. We're passionate uh, with each other about things, and the best idea always wins, so. Yeah. I think we have one more here. Oh, two. I hello, that's it. hello. Okay. Yeah, okay, fine. Thank you. That's kind. As a performer, you're a, an actress or a singer? Actress. Well, good luck. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I do have advice, and that is I'm asked a lot. That question comes up a great deal. And I always say, if you're passionate about something, of course, if you're really passionate about it, you know, follow your dream and, and do it. But you never know, I never knew, when that phenomenal break might pass right under your nose at any minute. So do your homework. Be ready. And, and it seems to be the best thing I could say to people. Do your homework. I mean, it applies to anything, of course, but if you really want to be good at it, work it, work it, learn about it, do it, read it, everything. And, the, uh, and uh, that's about mostly what I do say, I think, yeah. Um, and who else have it? Yes. Thank you. Ah, oh, how kind. To be truthful, I don't know. Um, uh, when would we see Julie's Green Room, the little, the Netflix, the, the Netflix, Netflix um, series I did for, the, for Netflix? Um, I don't know what to answer. It could happen. I sort of don't think it will now, because it's been, what, two years since the first? Uh, well, it's been a year since the first one came out, a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Netflix is very mysterious. They don't, they don't share a lot of information. Yeah. And, um, you know, we had the most wonderful time making that series. But and the puppeteers were brilliant and We did great. create the first season that... that that season to be self-contained in case that was all there was. Um, we, of course, we'd be delighted. Might, yeah. yeah, we'd be delighted if it did move into something else. But at this point, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to be moving in that direction. Sadly. And would stop us from doing all the other yes. things that we're longing to do. That is so. the other thing. I mean, this this second memoir has been under contract for some years now and got sidelined once again for Julie's green room. So it is nice to be back and focusing on that again. Got very little time left, and we're so late. Yeah. With I couldn't begin to do it if it weren't for Emma's nudging, pushing, <laughs> research, <laughs> timeline. She's done so much of it. I said to her the other day, I think it should be uh, the title by Emma Walton <laughs> Hamilton with help from Julie Andrews <laughs> because she's done so much hard work on it. And, and with this, we, we're, 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 we need to go. And, and, I think and we I, do. Oh, yeah. there's a gentleman. Yeah. You want to do one more? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. One more. Sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Yes, I know. Oh, he was a wonderful guy. Yes, the most phenomenal um, uh, uh, karate teacher. black belt karate everything. He was a master. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. That's fantastic. Wasn't he a lovely man, Ed Parker? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And he worked a great deal, this wonderful guy, as a stuntman and as a karate, well, everything, uh, with Blake, my husband. Well, he was born, he was a Hawaiian prince, actually. I think he came from the great family. Yeah. That's right. I'm, I'm standing around there in the foyer, and the, one of the teachers is on the floor, and there's a guy with him with short cropped hair, gray, gray. I didn't know who he was. And he's talking to this instructor. He said, look, come with me. It was Blake, right? Now this guy went with Blake to the back. Blake got dressed. And as the guy reacted, this is Blake said, I'll come with me, okay? And the guy goes, and he's the most artificial thing I've ever heard in my life. He wanted to classify it exactly as he said, I'm deep. Have had a big career. Yeah, <laughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> Just to finish your thought, Ed Parker was a great, became a great friend of Blake's, and this has nothing to do with this afternoon, but it's an interesting story, and it's it is that he was so good, and so, he was a huge, lovely man, gentle, kind, and yet, look out if if you crossed him or if he needed to be strong, he was brilliant. He well, I think we're maybe going to take the same story. He went with his family, uh, was going to Las Vegas, and was stopped with his kids and his wife in the car on the way to Vegas. Yeah, and there were some thugs on the road, and they were thinking they were going to beat him up. There were like five of them, I think, or seven. And so he said to his family, stay in the car. He got out, and in a few <laughs> swift strokes, he dealt with every one of them except one who ran away wisely. And they were all just lying about. And with this chop and that kick, he disposed of them all. The police arrived and said, good God, who, who did all this carnage? And Ed Parker said, I did. And they said, you didn't. I did. Would you care to come and teach our police department? <laughs> and that's what he did for a while. Yeah, a wonderful story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Julie. All. Thank you for that in the... Why? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the Oscars tonight, everyone. Get home safely. Go home, go home. Yeah. Thank you, Julia.